Today on The Build Show, I'm on the biggest gantry crane I've ever been on in my life. And I'm gonna tell you how these guys are turning logs into engineered wood products in the plant behind me. Howdy y'all, it's Jordan Smith. We are in Commerce, Georgia at the Huber Engineered Wood Plant and I got a really cool tour to see how they're making Advantec, Zip, and all kinds of other oriented strand board products. Now, if you're like me and you hear OSB, you usually don't think high-end engineered products, but this tour has completely changed my mind, at least on the upper end of this product. So I'm gonna take you through the manufacturing and quality assurance uh, program that they have here at this plant, and I think that you'll see like I did, that there is a huge difference between the high-end engineered OSB product or the oriented strand board that you'll see here in this plant and the low-end commodity grade stuff that you probably think of when you think of OSB. So first, all of the forests that these guys harvest from are sustainable. That means that they're grown and they are harvested on about a 15 year cycle and it's all southern yellow pine like you see behind me and it's trucked in from a 50 to 75 mile radius of this plant and then it is set up here under this large gantry crane. This gantry crane has a 15 ton capacity so every time it picks up a bite of logs it's bringing in 15 tons to the front end of this factory and those logs are separated, they're put as a single log in a way feeder and then it hits a slasher deck and this deck as it's bringing logs up this deck if they're too long these huge 48 inch circular saws are able to pop up out of the deck and trim it down to length that hits a conveyor and then it is fed in through the debarkers now the debarkers were really cool what it is is it's got six arms that spin around each one of these logs and it's got carbide cutting teeth and it strips each log of all the bark because unlike what you might have heard oriented strand board is not made out of leaves and branches and bark all of that stuff is stripped off either in the foresting uh, operation or at the debarker now all of that bark that is taken off there they don't just throw away and make mulch out of it they're actually able to use that in the heating process which i will get to in a second after the log has come through the debarker and all the bark has been removed it comes into the strander now this is two machines that are running simultaneously together and it takes the logs and it turns them into strands this is a strand now if you know anything about wood you know that it is strongest in the grain orientation right so i can't break this if i pull it this way but if i go perpendicular to that i'm easily able to break it it's about 20 times stronger with the grain than it is against the grain so what we're trying to do is we're trying to make strands that have a specific length a specific width and a specific thickness all of that is very carefully controlled at the stranders with these knives now I won't get into too many of the details, but basically you have very specific geometries that give you your, your thickness. That's how far your blade is off of the face of the strander. And then you have a back blade that actually breaks that chip. So that strand that's coming through there, they can set the back angle of this mating blade. This one cuts it here, and then this one, once it reaches that, it curls that chip and after a certain amount of curl based off this angle, it breaks that. So we can very precisely produce exactly the size, width, and thickness of strand, and that's very important for the next processes down the line. So once those strands have been cut to the exact thickness, length, and width that they need to be, they're fed into the dryers. Now remember what I talked about, the bark being stripped off? That is a fuel that is used to generate heat for the dryers as well as the presses. The wet fuel or the bark gets used and brought into a mixing chamber and then all of the sawdust that is generated on some of the sawing and sanding processes that are used later on, all of that dry and wet fuel are mixed together at a precise ratio to fuel their furnaces. So they're not bringing in outside fuel to generate all the heat uh, for these large dryers. These large dryers are basically just tumble dryers like you'd throw your, your clothes into. Uh, but again, they're not just drying it randomly to get some undetermined amount of moisture in there. It's very precisely controlled. In fact, they have two different RPMs 
they have two dryers that are spinning fast and that is what the outside or the two surfaces of the OSB, the strands that are going to be for the surfaces go through those fast spinning dryers and it is dried to a, a dry but not as dry as the center. It's about the inside's about 4% and the, the outside's about 8% moist, moisture content. Now I'm saying about because I don't remember exactly what they are but these are monitored very precisely, both the inlet temperature of the dryer, the outlet temperature of the dryer, the dwell time and the moisture content are all being monitored in the plant while they're running so they're producing the same product day in and day out. So now we have two different sets of strands. We have the strands for the core and we have the strands for the, for the top surface and the bottom surface. Now quickly, a side story that I think is really neat about this plant is they are very concerned about their environmental impact. Obviously, they're using a wood product, which we like because it's a sustainable, renewable resource. But the problem with pine is there's a lot of saps and resins that will pollute the environment if we just burn them and exhaust them into the air. So after this air is exhausted out of the dryers, they don't just dump it into the atmosphere. Uh, pine has a lot of nasty stuff in it that you don't want to just turn out into the atmosphere once you burn it. You want to clean that up. So they actually remove their VOCs with something called RTO, or Regenerative Thermal Oxidizer. I won't get into all the detail on how that works, but basically it burns and captures all of the VOCs in their exhaust gas so that once it hits the atmosphere, it's clean and it's not polluting. So Huber is very passionate about being environmentally friendly, not only on the forestry side, but from cradle all the way to grave, the entire lifespan of their product. Um, a lot of other competitors look at cradle to gate, meaning that from the time they start making it to the time that it hits their gate, their environmental impact is X. Huber wants to look at a longer time span from the time they manufacture the product all the way to what happens when that product is no longer in use. So picking the strands back up after they've left the dryer, now we go into a blender. So this is where the resin gets applied to the strands. Now this is a uh, polymer MDI resin and it's a high-end resin that takes a specific amount of pressure and a specific amount of temperature in order to activate. There are lower end adhesives out there as well that uh, might be a little bit easier to get a board stuck together with but by using a higher end uh, polymer resin we're able to get the lifespan that we're looking for especially when this board is going to be exposed to the elements and the sun and the rain like a floor deck will. So once we come out of the blenders then we make our mats. So this starts as a um, composite strand mat of about six to eight inches and then it's pressed down into that three-quarter inch final product. The strands however are not just uh, randomly stacked in there. There's a strength direction, a primary strength direction, and a secondary strength direction. And you actually have three layers through it. You have your surface, your bottom surface layer, where your strands are running in the direction of your primary strength axis. You have your core, which has the strands running perpendicular to the surface. And then you have another surface where it's running again with the primary strength direction. What's really cool about this is they're doing constant quality assurance to make sure that their boards are performing the same day in and day out and hourly the same. So they'll take boards off the line and they'll break them in both directions and they're able to change the orientation of the strands to make sure that the board is as strong as they need it to be both in the primary and secondary axes. So now this mat is cut to size. You can get six sheets out of a single mat and it is accumulated in a press that can press multiple mats at one time. Now this has eight huge hydraulic rams that press these platens together, taking this six to eight inch mat down to three quarters of an inch. And then it's held there and lets the polymers cure. Now remember what I said about keeping the moisture content right. The reason we want the middle core to be drier is twofold. One, we want to make sure that we're able to cure from the outside in and not have moisture slowing the process down at the center. And then number two, if we had moisture in there, it's going to turn into steam and it's going to create blisters or delaminations inside the sheet. And next we sand the whole thing down both for cosmetic reasons and for durability reasons. When we sand it down, they call it marbling. When we sand all of that top oxidation layer off, 
we're making sure that our adhesion between our wood fibers and the resin and wood fibers below it is 100%. We don't have wood wanting to pop up, especially when it gets wet. If it gets wet and we haven't done a good sand on it, you're going to see more of that wood grain popping up and it's going to be easier for moisture to penetrate. So that sanding makes it more durable in wet environments. After it's been cut to size, every board gets their tongue and groove profile put on it. Now, something that I learned in this plant tour is a normal tongue and groove where you have like a V, two V shapes that interlock on each other, that doesn't work so well when you're having expansion and contraction of the joints because two V's, as the V's move in and out of each other, you have play between the two boards and you don't have enough support when you're walking on it over time you're going to hear squeaks and creaks develop by doing a u-shape uh, tongue and groove you're able to allow the two boards to expand and contract on each other but you're still keeping a good vertical lock on it so you don't get those same squeaks and creaks with the u-shape that you would with a v-shape groove and then finally it goes through more qc checks the edges are sealed because just like on a raw wood product, your ingrains are going to be more susceptible to water damage. So the edges are sealed. The uh, boards are branded. There's a printer that prints the nailing patterns, all of the Advantech or Zip branding on it, and then it goes into packaging. Hey guys, thanks so much for watching. I hope you learned something. I hope I was able to convey all the stuff that I learned. My main takeaway is this is truly an engineered wood product. There's a lot of thought going into how this stuff is made and how to make sure that they're making the same thing day in and day out. There are multiple PhDs on this campus. There's multiple PhDs throughout the Huber Empire. There's PEs that you can pick up the phone to their tech line and you can get an answer to your questions on how to use their products. So it is a very high-end engineered product. Subscribe below if we've earned it. Go follow us over at Instagram and we'll see you next time on The Build Show.